The other, another strand is the opportunity to learn through speaking and through writing. And that should make up about a quarter of the course time. A third strand is the opportunity to learn through deliberately studying the language. And later this afternoon, we'll look at that from the point of view of vocabulary. And then the fourth strand is one which I think probably doesn't get much attention in Korea, and that is the opportunity to become really good at using what you already know. And that means developing fluency with the language that you already have learned. Now, fluency isn't something which should come at the end of a course. At every level of language proficiency, learners should try to be fluent with what they already know. So right from the very first day of learning a language, you can be fluent in the small amounts of language that you know. I was in Bali about a month ago, and before going to Bali, I studied the survival vocabulary of Balinese. <laughs> we, we did some research a few years ago to work out if you go to stay in another country for a few weeks, probably less than about two months, what language items do you need to know in order to survive for a short time in another country? You need to be able to say things like, where is the toilet? I am sick, how much does that cost, can you lower the price, and you need to know numbers like that. And we worked out doing research that you need to learn about 120 items like that. Now if you go to my website, you can download the survival vocabulary for about 14 different languages. Ah, uh, Korean, I'm not sure if we have Korean survival vocabulary. Maybe it's there, it's there, don't panic. But, <laughs> But we, we have it for Italian and Spanish and French and Indonesian and Thai and Japanese and I think Korean and also, <laughs> and also for Balinese. And so before going, I learnt the survival vocabulary of Balinese. So that when I go to the market, I can say things like, Ajigurniki, which means how much does this cost? Now, Balinese people are very astonished because nobody who goes as a tourist to Bali can speak Balinese. Anybody who learns a language beforehand usually learns Indonesian. But Indonesian is not the, la the local language of Bali. Balinese is the local language of Bali. So, you can get very cheap prices if you can speak <laughs> that language. But what it means is, even though you only know a few words or phrases, you need to be able to produce those phrases fluently. So even after only a couple of hours of study, because it only takes a couple of hours to learn a survival vocabulary, even after only about two hours of study, you can be fluent in the small amount of language that you already know. You learn the phrases very fluently and practice them fluently. Because it's no good knowing them but not being able to produce them or being able to recognize them. I remember trying to learn to read Thai, you know, Thai letters, the Thai alphabet. And I used to wait for a bus and try and find out where the bus is going. And the bus is coming, and it's gone. <laughs> and so by the time I've managed to read the words for the place where I want to go, the bus is gone. So I, I developed a strategy, and the strategy is Try to read the words and then try to remember the number which went with the words <laughs> and then look for the next number. But really, even things like that, you, in the very early stages and at every stage of language learning, learners need to be fluent in what they already know. So, the fluency strand of the course should make up about one quarter of the time, the total time for a language course. And it should be at all levels of language proficiency. Very young learners, beginning learners, very advanced learners, you need to become proficient. Now, how do you know whether you're, you have fluency activities in your course or not? Now, if you can't answer that question now, then you will be able to answer that question in half an hour. And if you can't answer that question in half an hour, I've failed. <laughs> I hate failure, so... <laughs> 
be ready. Okay, if you want to know if you have a fluency activity or not, then the first thing that you need to look for in an activity is to see, is there a focus on the meaning? So that means when learners do fluency activities, they should be trying to produce a message or to understand the message. Their, their attention should be meaning and message focused. So that's the first criterion for a fluency activity. The second criterion is probably the most important one of all of the four criteria. The second criterion is the activity must be easy, very easy. There must be no new vocabulary, no new grammar. The work, the language which is being used in the fluency activity should be 100% familiar. And if possible, the content, the ideas with what, that the learners are working with should also be largely familiar. So that's a very important requirement for fluency activities, that learners must be familiar with the material that they're working on. The third criterion is there needs to be some pressure to go faster than normal. That is, the learners need to be pushed and challenged to go a little bit faster in their speaking or in their writing, to go a little bit faster in their reading or their listening. And then the fourth criterion, there needs to be reasonable quantities of fluency practice. You don't become fluent by doing five minutes practice. So that's why fluency activities have to make up about one quarter of the course time because you need quantity of practice with very easy material, with pressure to go faster, with focus on the message in order for an activity to develop learners' fluency. Now let's look at a speaking activity and try to apply these four ideas to a speaking activity. One of my favorite fluency activities 4-3-2. Now, this used to be 5-4-3, four, four, but with the recession and things like that, <laughs> we've now changed it to 4-3-2. I have a horrible feeling that next week it'll be down to 3.5 to 2.5, but we'll have to draw the line somewhere. This is a very simple activity. What you do is you get the learners to pair up. You could even do it in a room like this with this number of people, but you would have to open the windows to let all of the noise get outside. But we've actually done it in rooms with about 40 or 60 people. Now, let's say everybody in this row is A. Yeah? And everybody in this row is B. That's a good idea. Okay. <laughs> everybody in this row is B. We go A, B, A, B, A, B like that across. Now, the person who's A... They have a topic to talk about, and it has to be a really easy, familiar topic, something they know a lot about. So it can be something that they've prepared, or something that they've studied already in class, or something where they bring a lot of background knowledge to what they're talking about. And then the teacher says, okay, are you ready? Go. And the teacher looks at the watch, and the le learner A talks about that topic to learner B. Now, learner B has to sit there and look interested. <laughs> you know, like that. I, try practicing that. It would be really good, you know, to look out over the audience and see people sitting there looking interested. So it's a good skill to practice, a, a good life strategy. <laughs> now, so learner B doesn't interrupt, doesn't ask any questions, but lets learner A talk for four minutes. Now, with younger, less proficient learners, you might go to two and a half minutes instead of four minutes or whatever it is, where the, the time that they're easily going to be able to fill with their talk. And then at the end of the four minutes, the teacher says, stop, change partners, and everybody who's A moves one seat back. And the poor old person at the back has to run around here and take the place, the empty seat at the front. And the teacher says, are you ready? Go. And then for three minutes, A gives exactly the same talk to the new partner, but in three minutes. Okay. I bet you can't guess what happens next. Stop. 
change partners, two-minute talk. And then, A then has done three talks. Four minutes, three minutes, two minutes, but they're exactly the same talk. It's really important that A doesn't change the content of the talk. And the reason why you change partners is so you can give the same talk to a new audience. And you can use the same jokes and the same content. It's great to travel the world and give lectures, as long as it's going to different countries where you have a different audience. And you can tell all the same old jokes all over again. Fantastic. And they still don't get laughs. <laughs> Never mind. And when, when A has finished, then it's B's turn to talk. And the teacher does the timing, four, three, two, like that. Now, we've done research which looks at the differences between the four-minute talk and the two-minute talk to see what changes occur. And, of course, as you would expect, the speed in words per minute increases. It would have to do that, really. But the hesitations per hundred words decreases. So the ratio of hesitations decrease. The number of errors, grammatical errors, in repeated parts of the talk decrease. And the number of more complex constructions increases by about two or three from the two-minute, four-minute talk to the two-minute talk. So it's really very interesting because here we see changes occurring in, in fluency, but we, these are also accompanied by changes in accuracy and complexity. And this sort of makes sense because one of the ways in which fluency develops is that people start working with a different unit of language. They move to a larger unit of language and organize what they're doing with larger units of language. And so that's not only then a speed change, but a quality, a quantity change, but a quantity change as well. Quality change as well. So that's the 432 activity. Now, is it a fluency activity or not? Well, no, I don't want yes or no. I'm not interested in yes or no. I'm, I'm an academic. You have to write a page saying why this is a fluency activity. Okay, now how would you write a page? Well, you would say, first of all, is it focusing on the message? And how does the activity focus on the message? Well, you, you have a ch changing audience. Yeah, you have a changing audience. So your, your audience is sitting there looking interested. Then you get a new audience so you can keep focusing on the message. Yeah. And then the second criterion, don't look, don't look. If you look, you take away the opportunity for retrieval. And retrieval is a really important learning condition. Now, what, what did he say the second condition was? Uh, for easy, familiar material. Is it, is it, is it easy? Yeah. Yes, because you choose an easy topic and you talk about something you know a lot about. Is there a pressure to go faster? Yeah. Yes, because 4, 3, 2 really puts a lot of pressure on the speaker to jam more into that shorter time. And is there quantity of practice? Yeah. Yes, because 4 plus 3 plus 2 equals 9 and then B speaks for nine minutes. So in the space of about 20 minutes or so, each learner has spoken for nine minutes. And so that, that's really good quantity of practice. And you wouldn't do four, three, two once in your course and say, good, that was that, where's the next technique? You'd want to make that an activity which occurred several times and even on a weekly basis or so. So that's a spoken fluency technique. And we know it's a fluency technique because it meets those four conditions for fluency development. The condition of a message focus, the condition of very easy material to work with, the pressure to go faster than you would normally go, and then quantity of practice to work with. So what we're going to do now is to look at reading. And first of all,